Hello and welcome to today's podcast. I'm joined with Liam, who is our marketing guy at Stilo. Hi, Liam. Uh, hello, Michael. Thanks for having me on the podcast. Yeah, very, very welcome. So, Liam, uh, you've been with us for how long now? Um, just coming up over a year now. So, just over a year. Okay. So, how did your marketing journey start? Um, so, marketing was. Funnily enough, it was never something that I set out to be. I wasn't in school saying I want to go into marketing. My whole background is in graphic design. So all through school, um, graphic design, graphic arts, that was always my my go-to. So it was Photoshop, Illustrator, all of those fields. Um, I studied that in university as well. So I went to Reading, uh, University of Reading, and studied graphic communication and typography. And then when I left university, I did get a design job, but it was also with marketing. And that's where marketing started to more come into play. Um, so yeah, I did. I worked at a real estate and asset manager in London. Um, and it was all, my first year was graphic design based. It was brochures, it was leaflets, it was any sort of elements of branding. Um, and ultimately that team changed into a marketing team and that's when marketing came into it so i've done a, i did essentially three years of marketing with them um and then joined stilo here and i've been here uh, handling marketing for the last year so going back because i'm quite curious as to when that shift exactly happened uh when did you was it that you felt you now more into marketing or was it actually mentioned by your previous managers and guys from today on you doing marketing rather than product design or whatever yeah it it just sort of happened i guess it, there was no there was there's never a written rule or no one ever said oh yeah we're changing a role it was okay so we're uh, we're already doing all the copywriting we're already meeting design agencies we were managing all the marketing for the business all the assets so it sort of fell into place that that is what the role was um having the benefit of graphic design as well makes it easier for someone like myself because when it comes to marketing a lot of that is your brochures your leaflets your social graphics everything needs to be done so having a background where i can use photoshop i can use illustrator i can it's it's having a one man one man marketing band, so it's a, a great position to be in. But um, yeah, it was never never something that was discussed. It was just oh, this is this is now the role, and you just pick it up as you go. But I guess you could have pushed pushed back, saying you just want to focus on design. You don't want to be involved in other stuff. Mm. Was that an option? Did you consider that? Um, funnily enough, so when uh, so when I uh, left my previous role, um, my portfolio and all of my work was angled toward a design career but i knew that with all of my knowledge coming into a company as a single marketing person would be an incredible opportunity and essentially what what someone or what stilo needed at the time you needed someone who was diverse who could market the brand set it in the right direction but then also have be able to save costs by being able to do a lot of the, the infographics and everything in-house which is what we have done uh, well so far for the last year yeah but then would a company of our size could be big or small depending how you look at it but would it be possible for a company like us to work with a marketing agency rather than someone like you who's in-house for one man band definitely so there's two sides to it so i've worked with marketing agencies before so as the client for the marketing agency and the only downside for that is when it comes to um so if stilo turned around last minute and said right okay we want to um we we've had a project come in today loads of steel delivered um we want to really document this process if the steel's delivered at nine eight o'clock in the morning and then we have to then contact the marketing agency they're not going to be able to get someone there to take photos to start documenting that process and then the stuff that someone might be able to do so on the office team might go out with a camera take some photos on their phones the marketing team might reject that as not being high enough quality so then you lose that opportunity whereas having someone like myself or a smaller small team in house it just means that everything is quick and everything is much more smoother so i know I can check what deliveries are coming in in the morning so I know whether there's going to be a, a massive pile of steel on our doorstep or whether there's going to be one or two beams and I can I can plan my content or I can plan the strategy for the next month knowing that okay we've got x amount of steel coming in today 
that's going to be fabricated. I can follow the whole process. I'll be here every day. And then even going out with the delivery driver. So having the flexibility to have someone drop everything and go is something that you miss with an agency. But then if you, if let's say we worked with an agency, we would, we would still need someone here who acts as a first point of contact. Mm. So that person would still still be here. So why can't that person just do definitely and that's, as, as you're doing? Yeah. So and that's what happened in my past role. So we were managing. There was a, it was a team of two. So it was myself and my line manager, and we would do little bits of design, little bits of marketing. But the majority of it was managing all of these other agencies. And there would be days where I would be sat waiting for replies to emails. Whereas I know I can get a camera and I can go out and I can take photos and it, I'm, it was a it was a wasted opportunity to some a certain extent and then you're paying me to sit at a desk yeah. and manage this person who were also or this agency who we're paying double my salary to so it's it's it just make sure be you're able to utilize who's there and exactly as you said you're you're always going to have someone who needs to manage that agency so if you have two choices you can get someone in pay them the same and have them manage it or you can get someone in who's a, a jack of all trades who yeah. can actively do it and then even now there's certain parts of marketing that are outside of my skill set that we do we outsource some some of those as well because there's always there's always going to be someone who's better than me at doing a certain job and that's the that's the reality of it um but then, uh, like moving forward, if we were to continue our growth, then would you sort of favor adding more staff in-house or finding an external agency who whom we work with? Um, depends on size. I think for a for me, my knowledge is very UK based or even London based. Um, so all of my experience has been in London. So if we were to launch products or a service overseas, I don't know how the US audience reacts. So the time that I would take investing in research, it would be more beneficial to invest in an agency overseas who understands that market and that demographic and can really supply a detailed campaign for that audience, um, it, which then falls back to the fact that I would then be managing that agency. Yeah. However, their skill set in that sector is greater than mine. And then working with them, you, you learn things, you pick things up. So that then ultimately does get fa phased out because you, you learn skills. Everyone who you talk to, you learn yeah, skills. Yeah. So would you agree that as a sort of golden rule, uh, businesses should have marketing in-house as much as they can and only use agencies if they're going abroad? Or would you sort of find middle ground in between? I'm... Um, and this will probably, if any of my friends are listening, this will really annoy them because no, I don't worry, just, I, just carry on. <laughs> I'm a huge advocate for in-house. Um, but then a lot, a lot of my sort of like everyone from my cohort in university to um, even my partner works for agencies. So, um, oh, I'm, you better be careful when you get home today. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> but that's a, I mean, I, I think that in-house is the best way to go, being able to control your team and have rapid deployment and ease quickly change your direction. With marketing agencies, sometimes it's a, a three month project. And if you want to change something two weeks in, you can't, you've already signed on to deliver that three months of content or three month plan. And some of them are flexible and they'll be more than happy to change, but some of them not so. And the last thing you want is to have a campaign that might not work or it might be for a slightly different audience. Um, a good example of that is for internally at Stilo. So we've got um, our modular and larger sector and we've also got our, our daily sector. And these are two, two different target audiences mm -hmm. and having the flexibility to jump between two because we represent as a single brand, we can have a so not one week we're promoting this, one week we're promoting that. It's um, it's more flexible and it intertwines and some of our content represents for both. Whereas if we had an agency, they might say, oh, no, we're going to deliver one campaign that is solely for this group of people in this target audience. So it's, it's hit and miss, um, but it's all about finding what works best for that company. Um, 
How about the interaction with the sales team? Because marketing and sales, they have the same KPIs, whereas quite often they fall out with each other for various reasons. How would that work if, if you work with an external agency? Wouldn't there be like total disconnection between, between the teams? It depends on how much, how much time these agencies are willing to invest in their research. Because I, so in my first few weeks at Stilo, I was sat with the sales team. I was based in the sales office. I heard every phone call, every conversation. I met the clients who were coming in. I really understood who sales are appealing to or who they're talking to on a day to day. And the, you can tell the clients they enjoy talking to and the kind of projects that they're working on. And they're the, they're the guys who we really want to tap into. Um, and a marketing agency, they might not be able to do that. They might not have the resources. You just give them a list, say, oh, our target audience is, and then they will supply something solely for that target audience. Whereas ours, we've got such such a broad range of clients and people who just come in day to day. It's, it's hard to narrow it down to one um, or just a, a select group. So yeah, having flexibility with sales, being able to get in, talk to them, even ask them about their projects because that's the things that you need to know is this a big project is it going to be spectacular because in the steel industry some somebody might come in and just order 20 tons of straight cut beams and it will be a, a fairly i don't want to say boring but it'll be it won't be visually interesting whereas you'll get someone who's got um 20 tons of um curved beams and incredible connections and that's the stuff that really gets attention and i won't know that without talking to sales yeah yeah and in terms of marketing it's one of those areas that's evolving probably the fastest of, of any what should be done today in order to for promote your your company um at a minimum now for any brand no matter how big or small everyone's the the easiest and the cheapest thing to do is just take pr pictures of your product and put it online. Everyone can do it. It costs nothing. The product's there already. And but online, what do you mean by putting it online? Uh, so any social media platform or anywhere, anywhere you can. And so for us, um, when I joined Stilo, the, the platforms we had were LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And they're a, a base level. I, I think even now looking around, no company operates without them. If you hear about a brand, some people even now, um, they've bypassed Facebook and Instagram and they'll go onto TikTok and they'll see, instead of going onto Google or searching for them there, they'll have a look on TikTok, see what their company are about, see what products they're selling. And it's all accessible through social media platforms. Yeah. So that's a, something that you have to do as a minimum. And then taking it to the next level, of course, websites are one a lot of companies still don't have websites they're just operating through their phone line and it's it sounds ridiculous but these are investments that small companies need to make and there's a lot of free platforms as well so us we're service-based so we need if we didn't have our website we could be on my builder we could be on checker trade we could be on all of these different platforms where we can promote our service and I think them, I think my builder is, I think my builder is free. Um, but I think they have premium subscription plans where you can pay more. So it'd be higher up on the listings. Um, but yeah, any for construction specifically, every project you do, you can take a photo, put it online and people see it. Um, there's, I've got friends who's started or they're carpenters, um, and they've got wood workshops. They've found out for them, um, their strategy is just solely hashtags. So they use um, Woodwork London or cut bespoke wardrobes, mm. and they know every time, every single post they put that on, that's become their their personal tag. Mm. And that bumps them up there. So if anyone's looking on social media and they want bespoke, window, or bespoke wardrobes, then they bump up. Yeah. yeah. So what's what's the biggest challenge when it comes to promoting yourself because if you just stick photos online that doesn't necessarily mean you will be seen yeah exactly. so how do you become a viral uh, post this is the difficulties of 
day day to day social media. So there's no code for vi to make something viral. It just needs to be something funny, something engaging, and something that you would share with your friends. Can you fake it? Can you make it funny, or does it have to be funny because it was a real funny situation? Yes and no. I think there's a lot of viral content out there that's uh, false or they, um, they've they made it with the sole idea of being viral. Whereas, um, yeah, some of our videos, we've started to add a little bit of funny twist on the end of them. Um, but TikTok for me is the, the, the never ending, it's a never ending question. It's like, is it good for us or are we just getting views? Because we... Um, so why do you think it's not good for us? I think TikTok is for a, for me personally, I think it's targeted at a, a younger audience. Um, but of course that audience are going to grow up using that platform in the same way that um, my family have all used Facebook for their whole lives, but they were once young and now they're older. So they're going to be on Facebook. And if they see our products on Facebook, if they see our brands on Facebook, then they might purchase because they know us through Facebook. So it's trying to capture that audience and uh get get them get them early so we are we're always associated as being there um like everyone we always mention mcdonald's yeah. everyone knows who mcdonald's is but they are everywhere they're on tv they're on billboards they're on even when you go down the road there'll be signs saying 100 yards on your left mcdonald's that's one extreme but for us just being on the platform it might not be the perfect fit for our target audience, but being there and having a process or having a um, getting content out there and being present is is almost as important as posting full stop. Yeah, yeah. Now, these social media platforms, they come and go. Mm. Like you said, Facebook used to be a big thing. Now it's slowly fading away. Then there's Snapchat and Instagram and now TikTok. And probably a, a year or two from now, there'll be something else taking over or overtaking TikTok. So do you personally, like deep down, do you think that we're doing it because we actually want to do it and it's actually beneficial or we have to follow the crowd because everyone else is doing so we have to post on wherever we, we have to post? It's, it's definitely doing it because it's an expectation. Mm. Um, we have strategies and the content that we post is targeted to try and get people in or we're trying to showcase something however there are platforms that are be better for us and platforms that we post on just because it's there and because we know there's a, there's a following there exactly um so we we are on tiktok um we don't post a huge amount on there because the content is not always tailored for our target market and it's it fluctuates as well with all the um having viral videos and trying to catch what's in trend even the way that hashtags are treated on tiktok is a bit different but i think with tiktok or at least that's what i've heard is that it's now evolving to a platform where people go to to search for knowledge to educate themselves so in the past yeah. it used to be purely for just just spending time or just entertainment yeah. whereas now apparently there's more and more educational content and apparently the age average age is also increasing mm -hmm. not only because the users are getting older but also all, all, all the people actually using the platform so yeah. there could be a massive shift in in tiktok as it happens with other platforms where it starts as something else and then slowly and gradually it, it all meanders into something else uh so what are the biggest challenges or in other words how do you know what needs to be done on a specific platform for it to attract viewers so i think the most for um i've from my experience the best way to know a platform is to use it so at work <laughs> <laughs> i've been caught out now yeah so this is um so if you if i was if i had never used instagram in my life and it was the first time i'd ever logged on and i started posting photos i wouldn't know how the platform works how to like photos i you might not even know about hashtags so there's a certain expectation to know what the platform is through use um which is it sounds kind of, like an addiction to me where you mm. have to use it to use it so you yeah. have to be yeah. addicted yeah. to use it yeah, interesting definitely. but this is um <laughs> it's kind of a a yes and no situation because I use um, 
I manage all of our social media platforms, all the co uh, if there's comments, I'll be the person replying. I'm scheduling posts, writing captions, using all the hashtags and checking analytics. But in my personal life, I don't, I don't post anything at all. Um, so I'm a, I don't want to say I'm a social media ghost, but um, if you go on to, if you were to find my personal pages. And how do we find uh, your I personal pages? Uh, <laughs> I'm Liam Williams everywhere. Uh, Liam Williams or Liam Williams 96. So if anyone has any questions, they can ask on there. But um, I don't do a huge amount of posting on there. Um, we've got, so I, I don't do posting, but I'll do promoting. So I'll follow it when my friends have businesses or they're doing home projects or renovations or they make Instagram pages for their pets. I'll follow, I'll li I'm like liking all of them and I'm really like keeping track of every, not keeping track of everyone, but uh, I'm, I'm following the content and I'm using it for that. I'm not someone who actively posts. However, at work, everything is content creation and getting content out there. Yeah. So I think maybe that's a, that's where the divide is because I do it for work. I don't document or I don't post outside because it's, I feel like I'm working when I'm posting yeah. and okay. I don't want to take it too seriously when I'm outside yeah. of work. Yeah. So how do you measure whether a campaign has worked or hasn't? Is it purely down to views? Or? Yeah. So there's the great thing about sort of like Facebook and Instagram now is that they've for business pages and even personal pages, you, they have a huge amount of analytics that you can get your hands on. So Facebook and Instagram um, have a whole platform called Meta Business Suite where you can get in, you can see what posts have done well, and it will even automatically rank them for you. Um, if you want to take it to the next level, you can even do like a pre-test. There's platforms and apps where you can use your, you can insert your captions, your hashtags, sometimes even your images or your thumbnails, and it will give you a score to say, yes, this will attract, this will attract your target audience, or no, this is this is incorrect, change it to this. We don't go to that extent at the moment, mm. um, purely because it is, at the moment, it's very time consuming. So it's time that we, I haven't got to invest in in doing that research. However, with the analytics, we can qu very quickly see what posts have done well, if they're attracting the right target audiences. And I say based on our following, um, all of our content does, it does target or it's reciprocated by our target audience, which is what we want. There's no outliers. We're not being picked up by um, American fitness gurus. We're, we're being picked up by um, people in our industry, which is which is what we want. And the same thing goes for LinkedIn and Twitter. Um, they've all got analytics built in that you can you can take hold of and really really get to know your audience through that and understand what content is being engaged with, who's liking, who's commenting. Um, and yeah, it, there's just so many platforms now where you can you can get data and that's what really drives a lot of our campaigns at the moment. Yeah, so, so that's all online. How about the traditional offline marketing and other activities? What, what other activities were we involved in over the last yeah. year? So we've done, um, we've done a fair few ma uh, magazine publications. Um, so we, advertised in Reba, MEM magazine, um, and there was a few uh, sort of like catalogs and stuff that we were in for um, just for local tradespeople. Um, and then in addition to that, this year, we've I keep calling it sort of like the year of experimentation. Um, we went out and we did a fair few trade shows and really got our name out there and spoke to, spoke to everyone we could and told them who we are and what we do. Um, traceability on that and building building a platform where you know exactly where these people come from um is a great tool to have there's we've or for now with our sales team i've built a just a very simple google doc where they call if someone calls it's very just very quickly oh how did you hear us where did you where did you see us and then that we can find out through that they put it into this Google Sheet, which I can then go on and say, oh, yep, I actually spoke to this person at this show, or mm -hmm. they saw us on a billboard or in a, a newspaper advert or even on the radio as well. So these are all different like ways to track and trace these, these people and how they get to us. Yeah. Uh, and 
do you think, bearing in mind that the whole world is going online, is it still worth doing any activities offline? Yes and no. Um, so I said about the exhibitions, we found, so we've done some very trade and construction specific um, exhibitions this year. But one thing that we've discussed as well is, is there any of these exhibitions that are not for the construction industry that we should go to because there's other applications for what we need or we might go to the ideal home show and instead of finding tradespeople who are working on projects we will find the homeowners who then tell their their contractors to come to Stilo because they met us and they had a great time talking to us so there's there's definitely some variation in where you can find your clients especially when it comes to these trade shows um so i guess, I guess y yes is the answer to your question okay and what is your biggest challenge at the moment biggest constraint um that's a good one i think as a company stilo have always had marketing at the forefront so it's always been a very important piece of who Stilo are and what Stilo do. So I've never really had much constraints here. It's always been um, experiment, try. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, we've been quite fortunate where a lot of what we've done has worked and it's continued and gone through. And the bits that haven't worked, we've um, we've discussed and said, okay, so this is why it didn't work. And we, take, we have a positive takeaway from it. So whether that be um, a financial investment or whether it be um, <laughs> brochures that are printed and just have to go in the bin. Um, it's we take away. How how did that happen? <laughs> oh, we learned from that one. Uh, yeah, that was a poor time management. I don't know who by. Um, so yeah, but that example again. So um, the brochure that we produced, it was my constraint was time management for that. So it was ultimately the the print deadline. We let, um, it wasn't produced. It was for an exhibition. Or, or yeah, so um, to give the full story, um, when back, all the way back when I first came in for my interview, um, I brought in a presentation and we discussed all the things that I feel that Stila could do as a brand to take ourselves to the, take take it to the next level. And on there was a brochure. So very early from from the offset a brochure was always discussed and it was something we always said yeah stilo need this we need to get our name out and it will be something that we can hand out it'll be nice make it so it's um a very a very nice complete full in-depth everything you need to know about stilo is in this one booklet or within this brochure mm -hmm. so from the off it's always been there and it was always on the list and then it was okay so let's start working on the brochure gathered all the content together got all the content okay let's hold that there for now other things came in and then we said the the project or the the event that we were going to that was always the deadline but yeah it, it just got swept under a rug and and missed but uh we printed one in the end but it just wasn't the the quality wasn't right and if it was just all done if it was printed two weeks earlier then it, we could have fixed it and got it done, but uh, sadly not. But um, we're balancing things uh, a lot better now. Um, and yeah, that that was a that was the one one of the bigger pieces from the last year where we said, right, okay, so what went wrong? How do we fix it? How do we make sure this doesn't happen? How do we come out with a better um, something better next time? Um, and that's already been worked on. So yeah. we're yeah. we're looking forward to getting that out. And the industry that we're in, steel, uh, it is by many seen as a pure commodity. Do you believe that it is possible to build a brand around this commodity? Uh, I think well, I think steel are a prime example of that. It's already uh, half of the work was was done for me before I got here. But um, no, it's any any product, any service, any sort of commodity. There's always something for it. We always. Um, some people see steel, they say, or talking with the sales team, some clients just say, steel is steel. No matter where I get it, it's going to be the same. But it, when when you look more deeper into it, as we do, um, we've got, so where your whole supply chain is, yeah, it might, as to you, steel is steel. But to us, British steel is a higher quality and a, a 
commodity compared to imported steel from wherever in the globe. So having those aspects to pride yourself on and it's all about quality of service as well because we've got so the way that we operate is very different to others in the industry um so when it comes to even something as small as drilling holes a lot of people can you can mark up a beam you can chalk it out and measure it and drill a hole with a mag drill or some people can even do it by hand still um whereas for us having if you want something that's precision engineered you need to have the right machinery and the right equipment and that's what we what we do here at Stilo so if anyone's ever been to our workshop you'll see we we've got some of the most we've got so yeah some of the most advanced equipment for our industries um so it really sets apart what we do and what we offer in terms of the service um Oh, rather than yeah because it is very much so the service than the final product yeah. w what you get from us it it will be on time it will be it will f it will fit together perfectly yeah well that's yeah. that's what we guarantee yeah. Yeah. everything yeah everything will be there you're never going to have a missing beam it's it, what you what you order is what you get mm. and on top of that you have the bonuses of um the premium service that we offer compared to other suppliers who may have when your steel turns up on site your your holes might not be aligned and then they have to they'll have to be re-drilled or in some cases completely resupplied which has a knock-on effect on your project we don't do that at Stilo. everything is um well we say it all the time so it's in our core values we yeah. strive for perfect outcomes and that's something that really rings true in everything that we do here and that's why it's not just steel it's the service it's that guarantee that we offer that other competitors yeah. cannot at the moment yeah so since joining stilo what did you most like about stilo and what did you most dislike what's what's the lows at stilo yeah um so definitely when it comes to the things that i like about stilo it's the it's the freedom to do freedom to do what you do within reason so i know that if I want to go and document a project in production, I can pick up a camera, I can go out and I can uh, I can chat to the guys in the workshop floor, make sure angles are set and I won't interfere with their workload, but I can still do document and achieve my goals. Um, so that freedom is definitely a huge positive. Um, I also know from, I'm not gonna, go out on production and get some of our welders to be doing TikTok dances in the middle of production floor. <laughs> well, maybe that could be the next viral hit. <laughs> but there, um, again, it's having that freedom and knowing the limits and everyone is, everyone's just so cooperative here at Stilo as well. Um, a lot of places where you go, there's always what, a handful of people who don't want to be on camera. Mm. But if I'm going out with a camera, nobody runs out of frame they just know they know like okay like it's it's a benefit for the company and everyone's on board and everyone understands how important it is for to have this kind of content created and to have someone running around trying to take photos of you when you're yeah i i had this idea maybe we should uh revive it of mm. creating like a reality show at steel where we sort of have a few people that we track on a daily basis and all the stories yeah. in and out uh, something we, we could do. yeah i know um Eddie Eddie Stober uh, did a video did it before on Channel Four, um, or maybe just recreate our own version of The yeah. Office. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah the, so those were the good. How about the bads, negatives, about Steelo? Yeah, I'd say it's hard to pick out negative experiences at Steelo. It was so more, many. yeah, <laughs> loads. Yeah, I don't think we've got enough time. Um, <laughs> No, for me, it's, early, yeah. for me, it's not, not so much negatives, but um, yeah, it's just the, for me, it was coming, so like I've said, I sort of understood the London market, understand construction, but coming into a completely new, uh, a new field, mm -hmm. um, like I said, my role was graphic design then transformed into marketing. So coming in as the sole marketing person, it's a huge amount of responsibilities there, but I think it's, um, that adjustment period was, uh, days almost it was it wasn't long at all but i was uh, i was really able to hit the ground running yeah. but it's um yeah so it, the the only downside would have been that that period of adjustment where it's getting to know everyone and really like re-establishing myself within the team um 
yeah. yeah, especially after COVID, we had a hole basically in the mm. marketing department, mm. and yeah, indeed, that was, that was tricky. Yeah. Uh, outside of work, what what do you do when you're not working on marketing? Yeah. So, well, uh, I'm not posting on social media. <laughs> that's all, that's for sure. Um, no, I'm. I guess with yeah, going back to that jack of all trades, I do a lot. <laughs> I like to keep myself busy. Um, so at the moment, I'm renovating uh, renovating our house. Um, so for the last six weeks, we've been working on the bathroom. So the bathroom has been all walls down, um, floor up. So it's just been a freestanding bath in the middle of an empty room. Um, it got plastered this week. So now it's uh, starting to look more like a bathroom, but we're working through the whole renovation um, to purchase the house that had not been decorated since the 70s. So it was very retro. Everything was quite beige. You should have left it retro. <laughs> it was it was hideous <laughs> we were um it was funny when we did the um so when we went for the the house viewing it was during covid so you could only have two people in the property at a time uh so my girlfriend and i went in we viewed the property and we were like oh this is yeah like this is quite nice we understood it we saw the, saw the space and we were like this is this is nice it'd be a good project for us and there's a real real potential to build a family home out of this mm. um and then we went home we discussed it and then my partner's parents went and viewed the property as well. They came away and said, "No way, you're going to buy that place. It's hideous." <laughs> so, but it's been it's been a process. We've um, ever since the day we stepped in, because we at the time when we moved in, we were both working from home. So, we were working from home, working on the house. It was an absolute building site. But we managed to get an office sorted in the first week, and that was that was all we needed at the time. But yeah, two. Two and a half years on now, we've only just finished the bathroom, um, but we're doing well. We've got yeah, the office, the kitchen, diner, and bedrooms yeah. are done. So we're, I'd say, two thirds of the way through. Okay. But yeah, another year or two, and it'll be finished. And how about sports? Because you, I know you get involved in running. And how's how's that going? Yeah, so uh, I like to say I'm a runner, but um, I'm yeah, I'm no absolutely no good at all. Um, not up to not up to your level at least. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, you get older, you you you, you will get to this level. Right? Yeah, but it's been a uh, it's been good. I ran uh, I ran in school, um, mm. sort of like when I well yeah ran in school and then did sort of like cadets and things and always enjoyed their sort of sports events. So running on track, um, but yeah, as I've sort of continued, I've enjoyed longer distances. So I've ran a few half marathons, ten um, k's, and then looking to get up to a marathon but um yeah at the moment i'm just out injured but it's for me it's always been it's always been the technology and the buzz around it as well so um i'm not sure if you ever watch triathlon or have any interest in triathlon no, not really. no. so uh there's a huge race over in kona and it's their world championships but it's where all these so it's swim bike and run so they all the um, all the sponsors release their new tech okay. at this event. So there's new running shoes being released, new bikes, new computers, new everything, swimming goggles. Like it's just an absolute frenzy. So I consume all that content and normally go out and then spend a load of money that I shouldn't really spend on this kit that's not going to make me any better. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's always been for sports. It's always been the, the technology and all the equipment. That probably the means they get the marketing right. Yeah which means that people subconsciously feel like they're going to be heroes by purchasing those goods. So Definitely. Like I, I don't swim and I... But you have 10 pairs of goggles. Yeah, I've got 10 pairs of goggles. One of them has a little computer, so it tells you how fast you're going in your eye. Yeah, but ha haven't touched water in about eight years. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, thank you very much, Liam. Uh, well, good luck with all your efforts. Uh, I mean, from my perspective, uh, you're doing very well. It's, it's, it's nice to see a thriving brand. And yeah, to, to the listeners, uh, let's see each other and hear you at the next podcast. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you so much. Cheers. Thanks.